Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and um, welcome to this meeting of the Planning Applications Committee. Before we start, I need to read out the statement about the webcasting, which I've now lost. Hang on, I'll find it. Right, please note this meeting may be filmed for live and or subsequent broadcast via the Council's website. At the start of the meeting, the chair will confirm if all or part of the meeting is being filmed. You should be aware that the council is a data protection, a data control under the Data Protection Act. Data collected during a webcast will be retained in accordance with the council's published policy. Members of the public seated in the public gallery will not ordinarily be filmed by the automated camera system. However, please be aware that by moving forward of the pillar, or in the unlikely event of a technical malfunction or other unforeseen circumstances, your image may be captured. Therefore, by entering the meeting room, you are consenting to being filmed and to possible use of the images and sound recordings for webcasting and or training purposes. OK, thank you. Um, just before we start, I've got apologies from um, a couple of our members who aren't well, um, which is uh, Councillor. Yo and Councillor Leng, and also apologies from um, Councillor Hornsby Smith, who has a clashing meeting elsewhere. Are there any other apologies? Okay, thank you. We'll see him when he gets here then. Thank you very much. Which case we'll then go on to the minutes. Um, and I'm just going to say that uh, I'm not going to sign the minutes this evening because there is a fundamental mistake in one of the items that needs sorting out. Um, it's uh, actually minutes that we granted something that we didn't. So uh, we need to get that proper and we need to get the reasons why we didn't grant it um, properly minuted as well. So can I suggest that we take them back and we'll do them both tonight's and last times at the next meeting? Thank you. Have we got any other declarations of interest? No. Thank you. Um, we did have a question, I understand, but it's being put back till the next meeting. Please. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And there were no other questions. Um, and then we get on to item four, which is potential site visits on page seven. Julie Williams to introduce this. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. There's no um, potential site visits, visits listed on your sheets, so nothing to add to the report at the moment. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Um, just as a matter of course, uh, I might like that this um, potential site visit report that we get every, every meeting uh, is actually updated with the list of um, items that we have approved for a site visit uh, that have been suggested by this committee, just as a matter of, of roving uh, information that would be taken later closer to the planning applications committee, so none of them are forgotten or left off. I don't think that's a really good idea. And then uh, we've got a few pending, I think now, four or five. So yeah, helpful to remind us. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? No? which case can we go on to the planning appeals on page nine? Yes, thank you, Chair. So you've got your standard report there with um, appeals that have been lodged and also appeal decisions. There's a couple of committee report or officer reports on decisions received. And also in your update pack, there's a further report in respect of um, Stone Point for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Page. Chair, can I pick up on the last one, namely at Sown Point, um, the report or the summaries on page 11 and 12. Um, this is, um, as is noted, a six storey building on the east side of Market Place uh, with Tesco beneath it and formerly office space above. And uh, the uh, uh, application that has been granted is for 144 rabbit hutches, uh, euphemistically described as studio apartments. Um, and these have been secured courtesy 
of the late non-lamented Eric Pickles, who pushed through a change which enables owners of properties, uh, office blocks, to be able to convert um, them to residential without going through the full and normal planning process. And this results in the sort of substandard uh, development that we uh, see here. And that alone is to be deprecated um, because the council, as is rightly pointed out, doesn't have control over the minimum standards um, and a whole range of issues that would normally be uh, featured in a, in a planning application and planning determination uh, just go out the window. Um, also, this process known as prior approval chair means that we are unable to secure any contributions towards essential infrastructure. And as is noted at the bottom of page 12 in the penultimate paragraph, we're not able to secure any contribution towards much needed affordable housing in the borough. And uh, had this been a proper planning application, um, whether we would have agreed 144 uh, studio apartments, we certainly wouldn't have. We would have insisted on a mixed development of accommodation, but nonetheless, there would have been a substantial contribution to meet our policy, a requirement of 30% contribution to affordable housing, if not on-site, then certainly off-site. But again, thanks to Mr Pickles um, and thanks to the coalition, government and thanks to successive Tory governments, we have been deprived now over the period since 2013 of nearly £10 million pounds of um, contributions towards essential infrastructure and hundreds of affordable housing units have been uh, have been deprived um, or we have been deprived of hundreds as well. Uh, to say nothing of all the loss in fee income. And the next report, which we will no doubt just note, Chair, but uh, on page 22, we're told now uh, that the, uh, uh, the running total of loss fee income, lost fee income, nearly £2 million. Pounds. And that would have been money to resource additional officers, planning officers and enforcement uh, officers. So the hit to this authority from applications of this sort is not only substandard accommodation for potential inmates, and I use that word advisedly of this sort of accommodation, but a huge loss of contributions to the authority. Um, the one bright side is I doubt very much whether this will be built out. Um, most responsible state estate agents in Reading uh, regard this sort of accommodation as potentially unlettable because it is so substandard in a town where, particularly in the town centre, we have set quite high standards on those developments which we have approved. Um, but nonetheless, the principle of this prior approval regime is a disgrace and robs us and the local community uh, of essential contributions and potentially these rabbit hutches will emerge. So, Chair, um, it's a regrettable decision, but I urge officers to continue to apply uh, close scrutiny to these prior approval uh, applications, notwithstanding this setback. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sure we all agree with Councillor Page's words there. I'm sure he has uh, a cross-party support in that matter. I just wanted to draw very quick attention to the TPO in, am I shouting through? So the TPO in Caversham, I just wanted to congratulate officers uh, on their tree protection. Uh, even the inspector noted there is a strong presumption against removal of a mature protected tree. Uh, quite right, Chair. And I'm, again, I'm sure there's cross-party support for that. Uh, so thank you to officers. Not seeing anybody else. So thank you for that. We note that report. And then we go on to the applications for prior approval report on page 19. Julie, anything to add? Thank you, Chair. I don't think I've got anything to add to that report <laughs> as it's already been discussed slightly. Thank you. Anybody else want to say anything? I think it's probably all been said, but uh, thank you very much for that. We can note that. 
Uh, and then we've got um, on page 25, the objection to a tree preservation order on the Tilehurst allotments. Uh, Sarah Hudson is going to introduce this. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can you can you hear me OK? We can. Thank you. Excellent. OK, so um, as explained in the report, uh, officers were made aware of the sale of the land and there was local concern about potential tree removals. Um, whilst the site was already subject to a TPO which covers specific trees and groups of trees, that TPO is 22 years old now, hence the tree coverage is likely to have changed in that period. Given the land sale and the likelihood of the two allocated sites coming forward to development, an area TPO is considered appropriate as a temporary measure to protect all trees until an appropriate time when a more specific TPO or TPOs could be made. The objections from the current landowners, that being the Tilehurst People's Local Charity, are detailed in 3.1 of the report and the objections from their arbicultural consultant are detailed in 3.2. Officers' responses to the objections are in the following section, which I apologise is also labelled as 3.2, um, and that starts on page three. Um, officers consider that an area TPO is warranted due to the age of the original TPO, the intention to sell the land and the intended development proposals. A more specific TPO can be made at a later stage to replace the area TPO, but the area TPO to protect all trees is appropriate in the meantime until development proposals are determined and implemented. The recommendation is therefore to confirm the TPO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sure some of my colleagues will also probably want to speak about this, but um, I am um, thorough agreement with the uh, proposal to uh, grant the tree preservation order and think that, as usual, officers have done a stellar job in protecting um, what trees we have in this town. Um, and so I would like to uh, thank them for that work. <clears throat> I found it uh, very interesting, especially uh, regarding uh, the the um, the accusation that this had actually been used as a campaigning weapon and uh, the, the rebuttal, which is very, very sound, that the officers have put forward that state that that this is not whether a TPO is there or not is not um, is not something that is going to affect um, a future um, <clears throat> excuse me a future plan coming forward uh, and that's in section three number three on page twenty nine uh, so that's that's appreciated also uh, I I noted too the amenity uh, conversation and the fact that the word amenity is not defined by law. But uh, amenity in this case was determined to be a the view and b <clears throat> very eloquently put, I have to say, at the bottom of point number five on page thirty, that it should also be remembered that amenity is not only the consideration when determining whether a TPO is expedient, the nature conservation value of the land on which the trees sit can also be considered. Uh, he, she goes further to talk about biodiversity, which is very important, but I would also suggest that this is a wonderful place when we all realize that we're in the middle of a climate emergency, that the real amenity comes from tree retention uh, in this case, and I think it is right and proper that uh, a TPO be placed on these trees and that this review came forward after 22 years, so I'm in total agreement with officers on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ennis. And then Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just Sorry, to add on to that, I've had discussions with Councillor Keeping and Councillor Dennis of Kentwood's <coughs> wards, who can't be here tonight, but wanted to relay their concerns that if the objections were to be uh, carried through uh, of the loss of an area which um, should be preserved, the trees should be preserved, uh, how important it is to the area and to the residents around it uh, and the reasons that Councillor Rowland has given. I certainly have been up there, like most of us have during campaigning times, and saw firsthand the, um, the quite density, if you look at it, of the wooded area and the trees. And um, it's, it is a nice area and the residents um, certainly respect that, certainly on Armour Hill, Armour Road area. Um, and it, 
you know, the, the question was, is it going to be preserved? Are they going to be preserved? Um, can understand why there are, the objections are there because, you know, um, if they want to develop them, but they, they then have to appreciate the area of beauty to a large extent of them trees and their protection. So I certainly would relay the concerns of the two um, councillor keeping, councillor Dennis, the two Labour councillors of Kentwood Ward uh, and would support a continuation and confirmation, confirmation of the tree preservation order. Thank you. I'm sure the residents would welcome that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a few points. I completely agree with the officer's presentations on this. Um, I think it's quite wrong that the uh, charity have, have suggested that RBC is may have acceded to the entreaties of campaigners and uh, as campaign open, that's not what this committee or, or RBC is about. Um, and they also suggest that because there's already a TPO in place, it's not necessary for a new one. But I suspect and I suggest that in 22 years, the ecology of that area will have changed significantly. And uh, that's an unreasonable thing to say as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carnell. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. It appears we do have cross-party unity on this issue. I'd uh, certainly be supporting it. I've, I've spoken with Councillor Raj Singh, one of the Kentwood councillors who's spoken with a lot of residents in the area and they're overwhelmingly in support of the TPO. Uh, I can see no reason to refuse it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Not seeing anybody else. I will just briefly add that if you look at the, uh, the whole um, area from Prospect Park across to West Reading, there's a, a continuation of the woodland that starts in Lowes Hill Copse and then carries on right across to this particular um, location. And uh, it, it's also about the, that, that preservation of that woodland that's been so important for um, that area of Reading for so, for so long. So uh, I very much welcome this and I'd like to thank Sarah Hansen for considerable amount of work she's, she's done on this. And uh, let's hope that um, a sensible outcome can be found so that we don't have this standoff between a local charity and the local community. Can we agree the recommendation? All those in favour? Thank you, that's unanimous. Which takes us on to item eight, the uh, Gasworks Social Club on page 35. Bruce Edgar to introduce this. Thank you, Bruce. This report's in two parts. The first um, it contains most of the photographs, etc., which looks at the appendix two of the local plan, which identifies what criteria need to be met for listing. And <clears throat> it's been pointed out that there was an admission that there was a previous approval in 2016, which was approved and the potential purchaser is concerned that the lo listing the local building will have a detrimental effect on that approval. We've discussed it internally and the second part of the update for you, which you have in your papers, um, talks about the change of use, the conversion extension for residential, and that's all given in that update information. And can we go to this one, this slide one? This shows the river, river elevation of permission 160378, showing the elevation that's permitted on the left. And the existing elevation on the right. Now that's been in place, it's been approved, and there's no dispute on that. And listing the building will not affect that previous approval. Is that correct, Wendy? Yeah. So slide two, uh, this shows the south elevation with the same permission showing the existing elevations on the left and elevation on the right. Now, it's important to note that 
if it is established that permissions is still extant, adding the building to the local list will not prevent its implementation and it is not therefore considered a reason for not adding the building to the local list. Decisions on the local listing should be made on the agreed criteria as set out in the local plan. Thank you. Councillor Page. Chair, can I um, thank uh, Bruce Edgar and colleagues for the uh, report and the update. Um, this is an important um, building and the historic significance um, of the building and the context of the wider gas activities that uh, flourished in this area uh, back from uh, pre-Victorian times right the way through to the uh, 20th century are set out in the report and uh, particularly on page 52 it's worth uh, drawing attention to the fact that as is said here the two buildings on the site um, with the boundary walls form an identifiable industrial industrial group linked with the bridge over the Kennet which still has the splendid blue insignia on both ends of the uh, bridge and um, the last gas holder um, I should say January 2022 not 21 um, has now been dismantled and uh, uh, redevelopment of that site is underway which we gave planning permission for more recently. It's regrettable that when the owners of the site to whom we gave planning permission back in 2016 uh, then went through virtually all the discharge of conditions. I think only a handful remain to be done. Um, but and then went into receivership. Um, and uh, um, the site has been uh, sold and the new owners have uh, popped up um, with uh, and rightly um, referenced the initial omission of the uh, planning permission, but the important point to emphasize is that uh, clearly this listing doesn't in any way uh, prevent the uh, 2016 planning permission from being delivered. Um, but of course, if the new owners uh, decided to come forward with a new application, well then all bets are off in terms of the uh, previous consent that provides a framework um, but clearly um, the uh, uh, the fact that this is a now a locally listed as I hope we will agree unanimously this evening um, building um, further underlines uh, its importance it's been empty for many years I, I as a count as a representative of the then Southern Gas Consumers Council back in the late 70s had regular meetings uh, there uh, chair um, and the uh, uh, the Southern Gas Social uh, Club was uh, a thriving and well patronised uh, um, institution um, that has now closed. The building has been derelict for many years and vandalised and squatted in, um, and uh, we were therefore delighted when we gave planning permission back in 2016 and disappointed that the uh, uh, owners then went. Uh, uh, bankrupt. Um, so hopefully um, the new owners will take forward the previous uh, uh, consent. Uh, quite whether there is an extant planning permission is referenced um, in the update uh, report, although I'm advised that sufficient works have been done internally to, to have triggered it, but that's a discussion that they need to have with the planning officers. I'm sure with goodwill we would want to see the existing uh, consent implemented but chair that doesn't detract from the importance of the local listing and i'm uh, quite happy to move that we agree the recommendation um uh, before us this evening thank you thank you councillor Rowland. yes thank you chair i'd just like to add that um some hundred plus years on that this uh, site remains to be of great importance and interest uh, in the Reading community. And uh, it is actually one of the sites that services uh, most frequently uh, in my emails as the town's heritage champion. 
And also, um, I notice there's always constantly frequent um, uh, conversation about it on social media. This is a building and a site that is very much loved by the community. And the uh, points in uh, on page 38 about its social importance and about its industrial importance is something that rings really true for Reading. Um, so I'd like to highlight that and also um, the the architectural interest, which may, if the extent planning permission is carried out, may alter. So I do thank officers for placing that uh, up uh, in front of us to take a look at how that building uh, is currently and how that is proposed to change. Um, before I was a counselor, I remember this coming up and I also remember sitting out there in the public gallery and watching uh, how carefully uh, um, the officers had worked and also the counselors uh, had worked to ensure that the exuberance and the, the interest of the building was still retained even though it was going to become somewhat larger. Uh, that the the style and the uh, and what it really looks like from the Kennett, which I think we can all agree is a really remarkable uh, view, that 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 really uh, even though changed and and uh, will be somewhat larger remains. So um, I I am happy and pleased that this would be locally listed. I would heartily agree with the officer's recommendation on that. And I do hope that the developers bear that in mind, that this is a site for over 100 plus years that has been of great interest to this town. And it is, it is one would call a, a landmark along the Kennett. And uh, yeah, happy with the suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Don't see anybody else. So uh, can we move to that? those who want to approve this agreed recommendation? Thank you, that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Which takes us on to the planning applications to be considered. We only have two tonight, and one of them has attracted public speaking. So in, we always take the ones that have public speaking first. So we'll go now on to item 10 now, which is for Downshire Square on page 85. And um, we'll get the case officer to introduce it. And then I will ask those objecting to share out their five minutes between them. And then uh, the um, agent will also get an opportunity to speak for five minutes. And we've also got Councillor Gittings, um, who's dialing in um, to speak as one of the ward councillors. So I hope that's clear. Um, so we'll move on to the introduction now, please. Thank you. And Ethne Humphreys will introduce it. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for one detached and two semi-detached dwellings following demolition of the existing bungalow and garage. There is an update report for this item on page 19 of the update pack. This amends the recommendation to include an additional obligation in the legal agreement in respect of a proposed street tree and stipulates the use of timber windows and doors in the materials condition. The update report also provides clarification on room sizes on the BAT assessment undertaken and includes a consultation response from the Council's Conservation and Urban Design Officer. To confirm, there is no objection to the proposals on heritage grounds from the Conservation and Urban Design Officer. Further to the update report, it is also confirmed that parking permit conditions, which are omitted in error on the main agenda report, are proposed to be attached should planning permission be forthcoming. It is also confirmed that pre-commencement conditions have been agreed by the agent. Since the publication of the main agenda report, a petition has been received of 26 signatures from residents of Downshire Square. This is worded as follows. We, the undersigned, are concerned local residents who urge Reading Borough Council to refuse planning permission. Public objections to the application have been summarised and addressed in the main agenda report and update report, and the petition does not raise any additional planning considerations. The scheme is considered to be acceptable in terms of its design and impact on the character and appearance of the conservation area and street scene, the quality of accommodation and amenity space for future occupiers, the impact on neighbouring properties, provision of soft landscaping, biodiversity enhancements, parking and affordable housing matters. The recommendation is to approve, subject to the recommended conditions to include the standard parking permit condition, 
and the completion of legal agreement as set out within the main agenda report and as amended in the update report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so if the people who are sharing out the objectors time want to come and sit at the table and I believe um, that we've got Helen Humphreys going first and then Andrea Lambourne Moss uh, and then Misha Title from the um, Conservation Area Advisory Committee. I hope I've got that right but if you'd like to just introduce yourselves and then we'll start to time you after that. Good evening. Uh, my name is Helen Humphreys and I want to talk about my objections. Purely. Sorry, can you just introduce yourself first and then and then we'll start your five minutes. Oh, sorry, I did introduce myself. I'm Helen Humphreys. And I'm Andy Lambel Moss. And I'm Misha Tyler. Right. Welcome. Thank you. So you're going first then, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah okay. thank you. Um, I want to talk about my objections purely on a personal level and how it would affect my family and myself. I live at the back of this proposed plan. We share a back wall. The existing bungalow is a solid family home with an established garden and can be maintained and used by a growing family. It is proposed to knock this down and build three lots of three-story buildings that will be much, much taller than the existing house. I'm very concerned about this as I believe I would be overlooked. My privacy will be taken away. My sunlight will be obscured and my view will be blocked forever. For these reasons, I raise my objections. Thank you. On Sunday afternoon, my husband and I called at homes around the square. Over half the people we spoke to were completely unaware of this proposal. No one was in favour of the proposal. Every single person we spoke to signed the petition. The number of signatories is now up to 27. If we had had more time, we would have collected more signatures as we called on less than half of the houses. Parking on the square is awful. The residents that do not have driveways have a dreadful time. Directly opposite Maysmore is a care home. Disabled access vehicles are in frequent use. The residents of that care home do not need more parking issues. The enlarged entrance will reduce car parking space on the square. Off-road parking is included, but two of these are nose to tail, so cars will end up on the road anyway. And none of this considers an increase in traffic due to more houses. Section 6.4.8 states that there will be no adverse impact on biodiversity. How can significantly reducing the amount of space available for plant and animal life not have a significant adverse effect? Section 6.18 states, the success of the project will depend on the quality and finishing. These developers have not demonstrated any ability to maintain Maysmore to a high quality, allowing and possibly encouraging the site to deteriorate. They allowed vehicles to be stored on site, including repair work being carried out with all the associated noise and mess. On a personal level, a new wall will be this far from my south facing windows. Section 6.28 states, it is required that developments do not cause a detrimental impact on sunlight and daylight. The very next paragraph acknowledges that access to sunlight and daylight will undoubtedly change. My housebound father's living space is on the first floor. He will lose all direct sunlight through his south facing window an extremely significant loss of daylight, plus a complete loss of view due to there being a large wall in the way. We have at least two further windows that will also be impacted. Section 6.30 states that these proposals are not considered to result in any significant material loss of light. This is clearly untrue. In conclusion, I acknowledge new housing is needed in Reading, but this plan increases housing stock by just two units, which are at a maximum permissible scale and layout, section 6.16. Are two additional squeezed in units worth the cost of upsetting so many residents, pulling down a historic gem, making parking and traffic even worse, and putting a wall across my father's view and light? Thank you. 
Um, just to confirm, I'm, I'm also a local resident as well as a representative from the CAC. Um, I just want to start by saying that the photographs don't appear to be very clear. I, I have personally struggled to find, to understand exactly how it will look when the development is, proposed development would be completed. Um, I just want to start by saying the Downshire Square Conservation Area appraisal notes that the variety, exuberance and blend of the architectural style of the Victorian and later periods and Maysmore for Downshire Square is a prime example of that variety. It's a unique chalet style bungalow and its demolition would fail to preserve the character and appearance of the conservation area. There is a similar unique property at 114 Kendrick Road, which became Reading's first locally listed building. The property is not in the conservation area. Here the bungalow has been retained and extension added to the rear, and we feel this would be a better design solution for the site as well. Reading should provide a variety of housing needs and Ford Downshire Square meets the need for a, a compact property with a large garden and detached garage. Thank you, Chair. Indeed, perfectly timed, thank you. Um, has any member of the committee got questions for the objectors? Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks very much. Oh, I can't see any of you guys. Hello. Um, I could hear the emotion in your voices. Thank you very much for speaking to us this evening, um, all three of you. I wanted to ask something and to be clear. Does anyone object to the loss of the existing building? Or do you object to the replacement that is proposed? Or, or is it indeed both? Just to be clear, we object to both. We feel that the existing building could be uh, renovated and it could be extended. And there are not many ground floor accommodations in the area at all. In fact, we don't believe there's any in the area. Sorry. Um, yes, and we'll then have um, the agent um, beaming in from on the phone. Oh, hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Would you like to introduce yourself and then we'll start to time your five minutes? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Edward Mather from Colony Architects and I'm representing the applicant this evening. Um, so, there we are. Um, so thank you for allowing me to speak and thank you, Ethne, for your introduction. Um, we've been working on the scheme for many years now submitted two previous applications and an appeal. As a background to the proposal, the dismissed appeal should not be forgotten. It establishes many useful principles that have assisted in shaping the proposals before us tonight. Ethne has covered the application scheme context very well, so, so I'm not going to repeat this. I'm just going to focus on the areas of concern raised during the consultation process and explain how the scheme has, been de has dealt with these matters. I'd like to start with the bungalow. It's currently a low-scale bungalow positioned centrally in what's an abnormally large plot, not typical within this conservation area. We acknowledge that CAC objects to the loss of this property. However, it's quite clear in the appeal that the inspector does not raise um, the preservation of the bungalow as a dismissal reason. Rather, there is acknowledgement that the site can be developed. The conservation officer, furthermore, confirms the building is of moderate value and does not object to the demolition. And it is also not listed as a building of townscape merit. With respect to the impact on the sort of wider conservation area, the conservation area officer has reviewed the proposals and considers the scheme to have a neutral impact on the conservation area. The nearby buildings are not listed or mentioned within the appraisal. Therefore, the proposal, the proposed impact is, is limited. During the design process, the design team reviewed the character of the conservation area, its diverse mix of architectural styles, and all of this informed the aesthetics and form of the scheme. Um, with the, the sort of philosophy has been to use similar materials and traditional detailing to help bind the scheme to the context um, and also have a sort of varying materials between the two properties to sort of uh, replicate that diverse architecture found in Downshire Square. Looking sort of more at the sort of the bulk and scale of the proposals, um, it should be noted again that the inspector found that the previous scheme wasn't unreasonable, but also referred to All Saints Court next door and suggested by splitting that into two buildings, it would be more successful. We've effectively taken on that approach in this proposal, albeit we've given larger gaps between the buildings to in fact improve upon that sort of position. 
Um, and, and, and this has been represented with effectively a smaller footprint, uh, a, limit, a more limited scale of development, and, and overall we think it's more fitting to the sort of conservation area. Overlooking was another concern, and I should just probably point out a few facts here really, and that, that the building's window to window distances to the properties behind is 22 metres, which is greater than the guidance figure within the local policy. We've also had a look at the layout of the plans and placed windows uh, more central to the plots, so there's less, you know, overlooking to the near neighbouring gardens. And furthermore, the, the windows, say, to um, All Saints Court are slightly obscured, and those to um, uh, number six to the north, it should be noted that effectively the property is set halfway back from that. Um, from those windows, so it's, they're not fully obscuring them. Um, so, and, and I believe that the middle window there serves um, a second, second window to a bedroom, and the upper window serves an attic room. The attic room of which still maintains good daylight um, over the roof scape of the proposal. And finally, I'd just like to sort of move on to the sort of parking. I mean, ultimately, RBC Transport Department has not objected to the scheme. Each dwelling has two parking spaces. And it, and it shouldn't be forgotten that obviously it's, it's pretty central to the town, lots of transport links and local amenities. So I'd just like to summarise really with the scheme benefits. And so first of all, the, the planning inspector has agreed that the scheme is capable of being developed without harming the conservation area. And the bungalow is not of such merit that it needs to be protected. The scheme represents more efficient use of the sites, bringing much needed family housing to the area. The proposal is a high quality design, taking inspiration from the character of the conservation area. The scheme has a good affordable housing provision um, and finally the three houses will be low carbon large family dwellings within walking distance to the town centre and I think these are quite a rare uh, rare thing for planning to be consenting in, in Reading Town Centre at this time. Anyway we feel that this design has overcome many concerns raised and we hope that members can support the proposals by agreeing with the officer's recommendation for approval. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes, if you could stay on the line. Are there any questions? Councillor Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I have um, several. Um, shall I, do you want to ask the agent if he'd like them all at once or one at a time, Chair? What would you prefer? Oh, one at a time, please. OK. Uh, so the first question I had was uh, why the developer has not had any pre-application on any of the um, proposals. I just think is pertinent in terms of how we've come to where we have. Okay, good, good question. Um, well, actually, we've, as I say, we've had a few applications on this site already. Before those two applications, we have had a pre-application uh, submission. That was many years ago in, in Trees. Um, and so, so there has been one. And not only that, when you then had a pre-app, two further applications and an appeal, there's quite an established dialogue and narrative with officers and consultees that have, you know, you don't need to necessarily repeat it with a further pre -app. Thank you, Chair. Um, my next question is on sustainability. Um, I appreciate it's conditioned, but I don't know if you can tell us what is intended. Um, it refers to some tree planting and some charging points, but I can't see much referral to heating systems or anything of the like. And I'm not sure if you're at that stage to um, comment on any of that. Sure. No, I mean, it's a, it's a number of um, factors, really. So obviously, um, I think it's by it's compulsory these days to have, you know, vehicle charging points. And I think there's a condition to suggest that that will need to be per dwelling. The dwellings themselves will be, um, you know, I say zero carbon. They'll be, they'll be very carbon efficient, i.e. they'll be well insulated, probably have air source heat pumps, um, try and avoid the sort of PV. But um, We'll see and effectively we'll have to submit some form of proposal when the design has got to that level of detail to reassure the council by condition that it will be um, covered. In terms of ecology, well, there is a scheme for landscaping, new tree planting, um, that's front and rear. Uh, and, and, and in addition to that, we have some bat boxes, swift boxes, other sort of ecological enhancements that um, you know, help the scheme sort of be sort of neutral on that front. Thank you, Chair. I promise just two more. Um, I just wondered whether the applicant had considered skylights. Um, that's something we normally see for three storey developments, and I was just interested as to why they hadn't been included in the designs. 
Okay, yeah, good one. So I think actually at one point we did have some skylights, but I think during the, um, the application process, in consultation with the officer, we actually sort of flipped them over some dormers and brought them in a bit more centrally because I think it was felt that that was a better look from the front and the rear. So that's, yeah, um, that's that's why we've done that. And I think obviously it also means that the quality of the accommodation uh, is, a, is a bit better. Um, the skylights aren't, you know, they serve a purpose, but it's, it's better to have a, a dormer. Thank you, Chair. And my last one is just in relation to the two semis. Um, the materials are obviously quite different to the neighbouring property, but not quite matching All Saints Court. And I just wanted to understand the rationale for that. It kind of sticks out and looks slightly unsympathetic. OK, fair, fair point. I mean, there's two, there's two, two points here. One, I suppose the, the, the design rationale has been, has been to, you know, if you go on the street scene, every house is a little bit different, colour, tone, texture, um, age. So we're trying to sort of uh, continue that sort of philosophy. I think perhaps the colour of it's a slight graphical thing. Uh, and, and in reality, we'll be submitting materials by condition to, to make sure that the conservation officer and the planning officer are, are satisfied that it's going to be uh, the right brick for that setting. And if they feel that it, it you know, on reflection, it needs to match uh, also, it's court, then you know we'll, we'll we'll work with them on that. That's fine. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. And um, Mr. Mather, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, um, primarily, actually, I'll just I'll just uh, lead with one. Um, yeah, obviously you realize this is a conservation area and you also realize that despite the loss of an interwar um, bungalow, I feel like I'm getting a lot of reverb. Some sort of funny feedback going, I think we can all hear it. I hope it's not stopping people listening to what's being said, but it's it's annoying to say the least. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what that is. Um, but at any rate, um, this this being in a conservation area, we've lost an interwar or we're losing an interwar bungalow, which was not supported in the um, the appeals, uh, and it was deemed that that unfortunately would be um, not really objected to. But um, Mr. Mather, I usually hold your architecture firm in in, in some regard, um, but I was actually. Um, um, kind of my, my first inclination was to say, and I don't say this to be um, rude in any way, because it is a technique. Uh, it, it seems kind of a pastiche almost in that the uh, building to the one side, it takes on the elements and, and materials of the of the house directly to that side and then on the other side the double gable building seems to just kind of in reverse uh, uh, work with the um, I guess the All Saints Court to the right and uh, you said that you drew on inspiration from the um, from the conservation area but um, and again I don't say pastiche to be rude but how is this, in terms of conservation area, uh, pres preserving, protecting, or where possible, enhancing? I realize they may not stick out, but can you speak about any enhancements that might be gained off of this design? And is there uh, even yet any negotiation on that? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I, I don't, you know, firstly, a pastiche, I don't, you know, it can be taken as being a bit negative, but, you know, often recreating anything in a, in a traditional way, you know, is pastiche and that's just, that's just life, isn't it? I'll be honest, I'll take a step back here. During the earlier pre-apps, we actually did have a bit more of a, um, a contemporary spin on this site, but I think it was considered to be um, inappropriate. So we had to sort of follow more of a traditional approach uh, as, a, as an overarching aesthetic for the scheme. And uh, and you do point out also um, that obviously the detached dwelling does take a few clues from the detached property to the north and likewise the pair of semi-detached dwellings do, does refer to All Saints Court. That was a conscious decision um, but you know probably to sort of help it just sort of fit in a little bit more. 
my, my particular opinion on architecture and conservation areas is you've got to get the proportion, the form and the detailing and the materials right. If you can get those elements to fit together perfectly and finished well, that's important. And that is what is going to make the buildings uh, of a high quality. It's, it, it, the, the, the thought of making it modern or funky, unfortunately, was slightly taken out of our hands earlier in the design process. All we can do now, I suppose, is make this the most high quality, more traditional appearing scheme um, that we can. And I think that through the conditions of the materials and, and detailing, that's, that's probably the way that the council is going to best uh, enforce that. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll try this mic. Um, thank you for speaking to us tonight. You heard from neighbours uh, who have come into the Civic Centre tonight to speak to us that they feel they'll lose sunlight, daylight from almost completely from windows which are habitable rooms, rooms which they use uh, for living in uh, day to day. What, what do you say to that uh, concern? OK, I mean, I think it probably relates mainly to number number six to the north. Um, and I think the way we've sort of dealt with that is to effectively sit the detached dwelling. Um, I mean, first of all, the detached dwelling has a, a lower eaves than the other uh, properties. And we've sat that slightly back because the windows are sort of central to the gable of that um, property. And our proposal sort of sits just by them so the act then it's not fully obscure but obscuring them basically what should then be noted is the middle one is obviously a second window to um the accommodation on that floor so not only is it preserving most of its outlook it's also the secondary window and the attic room above um has a view because the way the roof's been designed it has a lower eaves at that point the attic window itself I suspect if we did a daylight calculation on it, we'd probably have limited if no impact at all it's because because our, our roof's sort of falling forward, if that, if that makes sense. So I don't actually, although I suspect you look at it on elevation, you think, crikey, that, that's quite, you know, that's going to do something. I actually feel the way it's positioned on the site isn't, um, it does, doesn't, it isn't illustrated well like that, and I think the impact's less. Could I come back quickly, Chair? I'm sorry. I, I, I'd just like to clarify. Are you saying that the, the neighbours are wrong, their concerns are, are not valid? It's just that the, the drawings don't give a full picture. <laughs> you think that the loss of sunlight will not be drastic in any way, but you haven't done an actual assessment of that? Um, I, the, the design has been done to set the building out to not sit directly in front of those windows. Um, I, I, I can't think any development in a town centre will have zero impact. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, but I do believe that the, the amount of impact on this is actually quite limited. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else indicating, so thank you for answering the questions. Um, and we now go on to uh, Councillor Gittings, um, who is one of the other ward councillors who's uh, going to speak to us online as well. Good evening, Councillor Giddings. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Apologies, I can't be there in person. I've just not long come back from uh, some, some business in the uh, in the north north of England, and I very nearly had to uh, like the agent dial in with a with a, with a phone. Anyhow, um, yeah, I mean, this has been a protracted planning um, application, uh, and as Minister and now Coley Ward Councillors, we've supported residents in a to opposing two previous um, applications from the developer and I must say I think in, in both those instances I think it was a great shame as highlighted by the questions that uh, Councillor Emerson asked that there wasn't much discussion around um, pre-application and the developer just um, just just pressed ahead and, and, and in our view and in, I think the view of the you know obviously of residents who are here tonight again they, those proposals were basically completely unacceptable. Um, we are also grateful for the work of planning officers from, from the council when the second application, which is put it here 200571, was taken by appeal to taken to appeal by the developer, and then I think you know believe rightly dismissed by the in inspector and the agent has actually you know referred back to that in his um, submission and I will as well. I mean the latest application 
you have before you committee we have to say it is improved i think that has to be noted and recognized um it replaces obtrusive style blocks and flats uh, with more traditional and slightly lower level housing although i think that's probably being contested obviously by by residents and i also welcome the uh, requirement of the developer um in in the agreement of a sum of 150,000 pounds for affordable housing because in the previous application that wasn't at all clear and that was obviously one of the reasons why the inspector rightly threw out the appeal i mean affordable housing is much needed in reading and, and references have been made to of that tonight of of the need for for housing but this is for affordable housing and there's also going to be a section 106 contribution but uh, you, you've heard I think very eloquently from residents three of them in five minutes who are deeply proud of their um, conservation area status and i think they have some very valid concerns uh, about this application I and mean, they believe the size and scale of the development is out of keeping with the character and appearance of a victorian conservation area looking at the objectors what they've written neighbors feel they will be hemmed in and overlooked and as we've heard tonight um with you know well with loss of light um you know with obviously with some you know rather upsetting personal circumstances there to take into account and parking sort of been briefly mentioned today but you know downshire square and maitland and brownlow road those are the associated roads already suffer from serious parking and traffic problems. problems there are two there schools a private hospital and a care home in the immediate area plus commuter park and riding from nearby west running station and onto bus routes so this is a significant problem it's been highlighted by all the written objectors and those speaking tonight and there are other issues raised around biodiversity and and the environment so looking back at the reasons by the planning expert spectrum for rejecting the previous application i did obviously take took, took a look at those and refresh my memory they exactly mirror those of the objectors to what is before the committee tonight and so the question for the committee to decide is are these factors significantly mitigated with this latest application now speaking as a ward councillor and representing residents i'd only want an application of the highest quality accepted particularly in this unique conservation area i'm not entirely sure this is the case with this application and i really do share the concerns of residents so i'm asking the committee take the representations of the ejectors into account when making the decision and to think very carefully about setting a precedent for future developments of this nature in the square. Think very carefully on that when you make your decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gittings. And we don't question the ward councillors. So I'm going to now throw it open to the committee, Councillor Emberson. Thank you, Chair. I mean, it's quite obvious that this is difficult for me as a ward councillor. I'm glad that Councillor Gittings was able to attend and share directly the concerns we'd already heard from the residents earlier. You know, for some, I know that they wish to see minimal development, and I've even spoken to people on the square who would like to see no development. And as a ward councillor, I can understand and appreciate the basis for that. But as a member of the committee, um, it's hard in terms of thinking holistically because we do know that no planning application is perfect and we can only reject on the basis of material considerations. Um, I still have more questions than answers, though, and this is the third time it has come. And I agree with Councillor Gittings that this is the best that we've seen so far. However, I wonder if it is the best of a bad bunch. Um, and I think I was pleased to see the update report and felt slightly more reassured about some points. And indeed, a lot of the conditions refer to some of the concerns made, such as the possibility of it being a HMO or shared occupancy in the future and permits. However, I have a number um, of questions for the officer because I don't feel that I'm in a place now where we could determine um, because there is more questions and answers for me, especially uh, further to the comments made this evening and the lack of reassurance from the applicant or the agent. Um, so if, if that's OK for you, Chair, I'd like to ask um, some questions. And again, I'm happy to either do them one at a time or individually. I don't know if the officer has a preference. Green lights at me, but um, <laughs> it's very strange. Um, up to you, I think. If it's one at a time, this might be better. 
Okay, um, I will try and go one at a time. So um, my first question was kind of on the materials. Like, I do appreciate the condition um, and that that is not a final um, matter, but I'd just be grateful for the officer's comment in terms of the aesthetics and being sympathetic about the conservation area as Councillor Rowland touched on as well. Thank you. The uh, the materials condition will require details and specification and samples of the proposed materials. Um, it, it was considered that um, rather than fully replicating uh, the, the, the built form, um, it, it was more appropriate to take on elements of built form either side, but to have a bit of a twist also um, for its own own merits. Um, the, the materials are considered to be in keeping with the, the built form either side and uh, the wider conservation area, but the, the material uh, detail itself will, will be secured under that condition. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my next query um, was in relation to parking. I mean, we know the planning inspector acknowledged how big of an issue this is in the area, and this application is different in that it does meet the policy requirements and having two parking spaces per property. However, I'm not reassured about the highway safety and the layout of the what are supposedly driveways but look like off street parking um, that is just put off the road. Um, so I would be happy to hear from the officer in terms of that. I know that there is a tracking diagram referred to in the report, but we haven't had sight of this. And this is something that I would usually expect to see in the report. And I think it's really important given the traffic on that road. And as we've heard, there's the school, there's a care home um, and there's a hospital around the corner. So I'd like some reassurance about highway safety, please. Thank you. My apologies, the tracking diagram wasn't included in, in the report. Um, I mean, the, the, the proposed development does result in an increase in two residential units, which would result in a daily increase of approximately 12 vehicle trips, with one vehicle trip being undertaken within the peak hours. Uh, the, the, the Council's Highways Officer has uh, stated that this is not a material increase in traffic flow um, and not such that would have a severe impact on the highway network. network. Uh, the site is currently served by two dropped crossings. Um, this under the proposal would be consolidated into one single central point of access and the creation of this access is not considered to result in any loss of existing on-street parking. Uh, the, the proposal itself um, provides car, park, car parking provision that's in accordance with the council's parking standards and so uh, complies with policy in this respect. Uh, and there's also uh, conditions to be attached, as uh, mentioned in my introduction, uh, to uh, restrict access to parking permits for surrounding streets uh, should a scheme be implemented. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Um, my other concern is about any future occupants and um, I did write to the planning officer prior to the meeting because the report referred to the application not being in keeping with policy five um, H5 rather. We know in the update pack that uh, we do actually meet the policy from this application. However, again, the plans are omitted properly from the report and indeed they're not on the portal so councillors haven't got sight of the dimensions and you know it's it's very hard with the floor plans we do have within the report to really get a feel for what is proposed so I don't know if any reassurance can be sought on that point. Thank you. Um, the the floor plans should be available to view on the public web website. They have all been submitted as part of the the application. Um, they they might not have been included at the uh, at the end of the committee report, uh, but they have been referenced in 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 the report and are uh, on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so those were the kind of main points I had. And if I'm honest, I still don't feel very reassured. And I think one of the objectors referred as well to the lack of pictures. And tonight, this is the most pictures we've seen on the PowerPoint. And for those members that aren't familiar with the area, it's hard to get a sense of the conservation context and, uh, you know, what we're looking at in terms of the site and the plot, what is proposed, 
in terms of overlooking um, loss of light. So, Chair, I think it is prudent to defer and have a site visit so that members of the committee can go and visit and understand. I don't think it has to be a accompanied. I don't think that is needed, but I think just that time for members to go and have a look because um, I don't feel reassured to make a decision this evening, Chair. Thank you. So we have a proposal to defer. Councillor Rowland, are you seconding that? I'm happy to second that. I concur with um, uh, Councillor Amberson's points and I think that there are enough issues that have been brought forward uh, in terms of the conservation area, in terms of the neighbours and everything uh, indeed to warrant that. And I'd be delighted to go on a site visit at this point. Thank you. Any other comments? And given it looks so we have a proposal, well, we have a proposal to defer for a site visit. We will be returning to all these issues when it comes back next time. So can I see all those in favour of a site visit? Can I ask a quick question? Yes, I'm really course. sorry. It's probably to the ward councillors. C can we view this site happily from the pavement or do you think we need to go into the grounds where the existing bungalow is and view it from all sides? Um, and, and that would then need to be accompanied, would it, in order to access? Um, and whatever the ward councillor says, I'm happy to go with. As I said, I my initial gut instinct is it doesn't need to be accompanied in that you can see it. I think the pictures we have in the report are not satisfactory enough. I think accompanied may be helpful to understand overlooking and loss of light. So sorry to kick the ball again, but I wonder whether officers could comment. But I do. I I think the imperative is seeing it from the road and how big the plot is and where it is and how close it is. But you wouldn't be able to look behind as such. You'd have to go around. So perhaps um, it might be worth a company to visit. I think my view is if there's some doubt about that, we might as well have an accompanied one with a. Uh, and then we won't have to faff about going back again or anything like that. So it's, uh, but I think it, it probably does warrant, uh, and even though you can, I, I went around there the other day to have a look ahead of this and it, yeah, you can, you can see very well at the front, but uh, some of the points that have been raised are not just about the frontage. So Julie, do you want to? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted also to check, hopefully um, this is acceptable, but um, during the presentations we received, we had concerns regarding the outlook from a particular window. Um, I, I just and I could see there are some uh, you're indicating when we're discussing the site visit. Um, would you be um, amenable for some members to be able to view the, the aspect from the window? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll leave that to members to decide what they they see in that. I think okay. on that basis we should have an accompanied site visit, um, and I assume it will be the next diary. Although we do, I think we do need to return to the times of site visits because it's yeah. it's very difficult for some members to be there at in the morning if they've got a, a, a job. So perhaps we'll consult on the best time and obviously consult with residents as well as to when it would be convenient for you and particularly your father. Um, so uh, can we leave that to officers to to work up a, a plan? Uh, Councillor Emerson. Sorry, Chair, can I just also ask that the points I raised about the tracking diagram and the plans is looked at because I'm pretty certain the plans aren't properly on the portal. So if we could get those remedied by the time it tracks back as well. Do you want to vote again? Those in favour of deferral? Thank you. That's unanimous. Right, thank you. We've had a long time on this, but clearly it's uh, an important application. So uh, can we now go back to um, the item on page 55? which is the all the um, applications for, for Broad Street. And David Brett's going to introduce this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. 
full panel policing and advertisement content is sourced to the upgrade BT Playfair advertisement screens with BT Street Hubs within the town centre uh, on Broad Street, Friar Street, West Street, and St Mary's Bros. These applications have been called on to be determined by the Planning Applications Committee by Councillor Page. The Street Hubs feature two 75 inch advertisement screens, one on each side, as opposed to one screen on to the existing units. Uh, the, the Street Hubs provide uh, Wi Fi, 4G, and 5G connectivity uh, within 150 metres of each unit, uh, free phone calls, and are equipped with environmental sensors which can measure air quality, noise, and traffic. Uh, the additional advertisement screen in this instance to the street hubs as opposed to the uh, existing units are not considered to worsen the existing situation within the locations proposed as the uh, presence of as ad presence of advertisement screens has already been established. Uh, all of the proposed replacement street hubs are within like for like locations of existing BT payphone and advertisement screens apart uh, from the payphone to be re replaced outside Bristol and West Arcade. Uh, on the edge of the marketplace and London Street conservation area. Uh, whilst the replacement street hub is located uh, close to the to uh, Fry Street entrance of uh, Marks and Spencers. Uh, in discussion with the conservation and urban design officer, the removal of the pay phone close to St Lawrence's Church is welcomed. Uh, it is acknowledged that the proposed replacement street hub is located closer to the Queen Victoria uh, statue, however, which is grade two listed. Uh, the street hub would be viewed uh, side on in relation to the, to the key views of the statue uh, from Blargrave Street. Uh, sorry, which is what I scroll. Uh, the street hub therefore is, to, is considered to have a less than significant impact of this on the setting. Uh, turning to crime and safety, as mentioned in the report, uh, the Thames Valley uh, Police Crime Prevention Design Advisor and Reading CCTV initially raised concerns regarding the glare from the advertisement screens on CCTV camera imagery. Uh, this is particularly an issue during hours of darkness. Um, this is currently experienced by some of the advertisement screens um, uh, within the Reading Town Centre. Uh, these concerns uh, were discussed with the agent and a solution was identified for the use of micro lubra film in order to divert the glare away from the CT CCTV cameras. So this film would be um, would be applied directly onto the screens to divert glare. Uh, the Thames Valley Police uh, uh, Crime Prevention and Design Advisor and Reading CCTV commented on this and have uh, no objection subject to the no objections to the street hubs subject to a condition requiring details of the micro lever film prior uh, to the um, installation of the uh, units. Uh, the officer recommendation is therefore to grant full planning permission and advertisement consent for all seven of the proposed BT Street Hubs subject to the recommended conditions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair, and I would like to uh, thank the planning officer for his thoroughness uh, on um, going into any number of these applications here, showing us uh, by good visuals, I would dare to say, uh, well laid out uh, so that we didn't have to go back and access the planning portal uh, to actually see what was going on. And I also thank him for uh, doing the needful and bringing forward the comments from the uh, Conservation Urban Design Officer in relation to the ones that were sitting in the conservation area. Uh, so I thank him for bringing that fulsome report to us. Uh, the concern that I have and um, is very much about the um, Crime Commissioner's uh, um, concerns regarding the effect on CCTV in the evening. Um, Councillor Page and I were on uh, some, some, I guess, night visits, uh, weren't we, uh, when we were viewing uh, CCTV and the way that it is, it, it, it is shown in the, uh, in the town centre uh, when you actually look at it and you get the glare from these, from these advertising consents or, and, you know, from the advertising signage. And that can be considerable, and as spelled out in this, uh, it can also de uh, it can also cause problems with recognition from a real in-time event where someone could be chasing around in the town center. So, their concerns are very justified, very much justified, uh, where we have an active nighttime economy. And um, I notice that, and uh, Mr. Brett, I. I I might kind of draw into some clarity here and ask you for some clarifications. 
You said that they seem to be all fine with everything, yet in section 6.34, you say that the micro -luber film is still in a testing phase. Could you actually clarify what you mean by that? Because you said that they were all basically okay with this. So um, could you tell me exactly where that, that micro -luber film uh, is at on these? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Um, so this, uh, this this product was um, originally suggested by uh, BT by their product team uh, when this um, when these concerns were raised by um, uh, the CPDA and the CCTV team, and subsequently um, they explored um, the uh, use of microliver film as a, as a way to divert the glare away from the CCTV cameras. Um, Hence the delay in bringing these applications to you today um, to it, while they uh, look into the product. I think they're, they're, they're trying to obviously replicate a product that's already in use. Um, for example, it's used on um, ATMs, uh, privacy screens for laptops, etc. Um, so they're looking to basically enlarge uh, a product so that it covers the um, full uh, display of the 75 inch screen. And then what would happen is uh, once they have that um, a product ready to submit and for, for details uh, in order to discharge the condition that would be applied to the advertisement consent applications, um, CCT, the CCTV team and the CBDA would review those details uh, along with officers to confirm that they address uh, those concerns uh, suitably. Of course, it, yeah, it was recognised that the, as was um, uh, shown to be by the CCTV team as well, um, the um, impact at night time that the, some of the existing advertisement screens um, has on the coverage and the image quality. And um, this is the um, solution that's been put forward to address that. I uh, hope, that, hope that answers your question. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Brett. It, it actually answers some, but it also kind of raises another point, and I understand a little more where these these uh, micro louver screens are coming from, but also I take into an understanding the size and scale of these advertisement signs and the, the distance from the ground they are uh, up to the height. These are now like slightly narrower and a little bit taller than the existing structures that are there. But um, I, I would want to know whether they've been tested uh, fully at night uh, and CCTV cameras have been um, have been able to observe that um, or not, and I don't know what what can be done about that except perhaps to insist on a materials. I mean, the material condition which is there, but also to have that um, that looked at by uh, ward councillors also, because I I would like to know that that's rather rigorous. And that the size and scale that we're trying to go for from that film actually standing against a person. I'm like really trying to think of it out there in the setting where that CCTV camera and the size of that advertising sign could could obscure important details about a real in life situation or recognition of someone. So I'm not exactly sure. Perhaps that's more of a question as to how we could get um, um, that condition at least expanded so that I know I certainly would feel comfortable with it as a ward counselor. So thank you. Councillor Page, do you well, want to? Chair, to make business, can I refer to the update and suggest that we amend that to include specific reference to the CPDA and the CCTV team? Because recommendation five only refers uh, to a sign off by the LPA, uh, paragraph 6.35. Uh, refers to um, a specific consultation with the CPDA and the CCTV team. Um, that needs to be written into that uh, condition and I would also want ward councillors involved with that and a practical demonstration in the suite just a few yards um, from here. Um, because I have to say I share Councillor Rowland's scepticism. Um, we have been promised many things that have been tested and uh, given all sorts of assurances. Um, but I would actually want to see this in operation and with the uh, experts in the CCTV team, both our employees and the police signing off 
uh, that it works um, with respect a written report simply saying it's okay is not going to be adequate. We want to see it working. We have a battery of cameras and a huge number of screens in there and we're able to test it um, in operation. And that's what I would suggest we amend the um, condition to, uh, to say. I think our Councillor Moore was indicating as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a small concern about accessibility is we're going to be removing every single payphone from these hubs and replacing with digital screens. And presumably you either need to be adept in using a digital screen or have a mobile device. I don't know what the usage of those current payphones are. I mean, if they are, that may be, it may be a non-issue, but I kind of want to raise that as an issue of potential accessibility. Uh, okay, thanks, Councillor Page. <laughs> right. <laughs> No. So how, we won't win it that way. <laughs> have officers captured the essence of the request to uh, be I have more satisfied about the um, the kit, which name I can't remember now, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the request that the the condition includes. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, um, normally when we have a condition, say if it's transport or flooding or whatever like that, we do normally say to be agreed by the local planning authority. But that includes that us agreeing it, includes us consulting with the relevant experts in that field, so but we don't normally specify subject that's same as we don't normally specify in the condition that it will include consultation with members, although we, we note that as part of the procedure in our discharging of it. What I would suggest instead is that perhaps the condition includes that the details will include, so when they submit their report with the proposed loop, it, it includes um, demonstra you know, evidence of demonstrations to you know, we could do it that way rather than otherwise it would set a sort of a strange precedent for us to say in how the condition is discharged that we list all those that we'd be talking to. I think it should maybe instead specify in the what we require from them to submit to us is, you know, demonstrations to show how it would work at night and that sort of thing. Do you understand the, the nuance of that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's fine. Okay, no, no, that's fine. But I just wanted to just clarify about how we will word the condition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Chair, it's just, you know, out of an abundance for concern. I mean, we are the, the uh, town centre ward councillors and we've got a thriving nighttime economy down there. And we're not, we are not, uh, going to tolerate anything that that could disrupt it. And when I alluded to Councillor Page and I being out late at night, we have gone on some of these uh, these operations with police and we have come back in and we have seen glares from advertising that that have caused problems in recognition. So we are, you know, acting within our our powers and everything. And I understand, I appreciate uh, the fact that um, uh, Julie is, is stating that, that all of these things are going to be taken into consideration. I guess we're acting out of an abundance of caution. We'd really like that to take place. So, yeah. I think we can find a way to minute that that reflects what's being yeah, said. No, yeah. No disagreement with the principle. I'm just saying mm -hmm. how we will articulate that. I'm still happy. I'm happy with well, all the give it some thought, and then we'll see yeah. one with the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I wonder if I could ask a quick question that isn't about the uh, glare. Uh, um, I've got a little bit lost when reading uh, the uh, the report and looking at the screen as to exactly where on these monoliths the bit that you interact with is. I think there'll be some kind of phone and digital screen on the side. Is that placed at a height that is um, suitable for wheelchair users. It looks from that one image that it is quite low down. But I, yeah, my eyesight isn't quite. Uh, could an officer just comment 
uh, it, it looks to be waist height to that individual stood next to it, which would be quite accessible. Yeah, I'm going to try and point this out on the slide now. Uh, so it's about here, if you can see. So there's a tablet screen um, on the um, narrow side of the street hub, and that's where you, for example, plug in headphones to make a phone call, um, all that sort of stuff. That's, that's how you engage with the uh, phone making facility side of things, if that makes sense. So it's, yeah. I'm not seeing anybody else. So with the um, understanding that the minutes will be closely checked, um, can we agree? I'm just putting a few words together. So I th we're sort of thinking <clears throat> where he says, no work shall commence on site until details and a sample of the micro legal film have been submitted to and approved. capture what you're wanting. In conjunction with the CCTV experts and, hmm. and, and the ward councillors, yeah. 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 OK, so I mean, obviously that wording will need to be firmed up when we look at the minutes, but um, we will be looking at them uh, when they come back. So on that basis, can we approve these recommendations? Thank you very much. And that's it. I'm oh, sorry about all the peculiarities of the microphones. We need clearly got a bit of an issue at the moment, so maybe we could uh, uh, pass that back, Simon, to get this looked at again, because it's, I don't know whether it affected people listening.